Up next on a second look, more than 30 years here at KTVU reporting on some of the biggest stories in recent history in the Bay Area. Now Rita Williams is retiring. From the Loma Prieta earthquake to the Pope's visit to Mission Dolores, dramatic rescues and a notorious child disappearance case, some of the remarkable stories during her long career. Up next on a second look. Hello everyone, I'm Frank Somerville and welcome to a second look. Tonight we dedicate this edition of A Second Look to our colleague Rita Williams, who is retiring at the end of this month. Rita has been a reporter here at KTVU for more than 30 years, covering some of the biggest stories in recent Bay Area history. One of those was the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. When it hit, Rita headed for the Bay Bridge, where a woman died when the car she was driving crashed into the hole in the upper deck. Also in that car was the woman's brother-in-law, and a year later, Rita went back to talk to the man who survived. La Cicita Halangahu is a survivor. He knows he's lucky to be alive. But what happened on the Bay Bridge last October 17th changed his life forever. The doctor can guarantee I'm going to walk again. And this, I don't know my future is going to be. This is why Lisicito Halangahu's future is uncertain. When the earthquake hit, he was the passenger in a car driven by his sister-in-law. It was stuck in gridlock on the lower deck of the Bay Bridge just after the earthquake. Then, he says, two men directed cars to the upper deck, but when people got there, no one was around to tell them what to do. So, as you see here, he and his sister-in-law started driving home to Oakland, not knowing about the break in the Bay Bridge until they were about three feet away. There's another car. Gosh! When we noticed the hole, we boom, and that's the last time I remember, till I woke up, um, I was still in the car. The car made it across the hole, smashed front first into the concrete on the other side, then dangled off the sheared off edge of the top deck with Halangahu and his sister-in-law inside. I try to move because I try to to help him uh, as much as I can. But uh, when I move, I I feel uh, my legs is when I look down to my leg, uh, they both dislocated. The Coast Guard airlifted Halangahu and his sister-in-law to Letterman Hospital, where Anna Mola, 23, was pronounced dead on arrival. Anna's anguished sister, Lisacita's wife, watched all this on TV, but it was a day later before anyone would confirm what she already knew. I can't sleep in the night watching the TV about the news. So I call all over the highway patrol. Knowing what we all know today, having seen this break in the bridge, it's hard to believe what happened to Lisacito Halangahu that day. But there was mass confusion on the bridge just after the earthquake. Many people on the lower deck couldn't hear their car radios. As cameraman Tony Hodrick and I ran onto the bridge from San Francisco, we met people running off, some asking what had happened, others warning us the whole bridge was collapsing. Liz Cicita Halangahu says he's only been back on the Bay Bridge once since the earthquake, and he'll never come back again. I'm scared. I'm scared now. A construction worker who used to make $2,000 a month, Liz Cicito now has had to move his family in with relatives to save money. He got a $25,000 settlement from the state, but his disability payments run out next month. He's already had seven operations on his crushed legs and hip and faces at least two more. Under a picture of Anna, the sister-in-law who died, this deeply religious man who came here from Tonga says what happened on the bridge continues to haunt him. Me and my total um, life is being affected, a mind, body, and soul. But out of death, there's life. The Halangahus have four sons. They say they prayed for a baby girl to help ease their pain in losing Anna. Two weeks ago, this seven pound, 10 ounce baby girl was born. They named her Anna. Still to come on a second look, Rita's coverage of the dark days in San Francisco following the assassinations of Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Mill. And a bit later, the search for a 10 year old San Francisco boy that gained national attention and help spark a movement to find missing children. Follow Second Look on Facebook and Twitter. 
Tonight on A Second Look, we're remembering the career of our colleague Rita Williams, who plans to retire at the end of the month. Before she became a full-time reporter at KTVU back in 1980, Rita was a reporter for KQED. And while she was there, she covered a story that shook the political foundation of San Francisco, the assassinations of Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk. In 2008, here at KTVU, Rita remembered those events 30 years later. November 27, 1978, 30 years later, and the impact of the nine gunshots is still being felt. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. And I took a look at me making that announcement, and I saw the eyes, and I thought, um, and I heard my voice, and I recognized for the first time I was in a state of shock. I remember it actually as if it were yesterday and it was um, one of the hardest moments if not the hardest moment of my life. It didn't seem to fit. Dan White, 32, the all-American boy, supervisor, former firefighter, police officer, now a killer. As Board of Supervisors President, Diane Feinstein was a political mentor to White. But before the killings, while White was unraveling, Feinstein was out of the country. And because of that, she continues to carry a heavy burden. This was my first day back at work. And I still believe that if I could have been there for that three weeks, I could have stopped it. Now, who knows, Rita? Who knows? What we do know comes in part from White's confession tape and other physical evidence stored here in the police property room. Is this all that's left on this case? Uh... I got a rare look 20 years ago at what was left of the evidence in the case that changed San Francisco and its politics with the police inspector who investigated the murder case, Frank Falzon. There were so many uh, people that suffered uh, uh, such direct uh, Hurts. The biggest package contained the clothes Dan White wore when he crawled through a window of City Hall, a 38 stuck in his belt. The gun White used was gone. This court order called for its destruction in 1982. They became a manhole cover. This is the original letter White sent the mayor three weeks earlier, resigning from the Board of Supervisors, saying he couldn't support his family on $9,600 a year. He changed his mind and asked for his job back. After Mayor George Moscone told White he was appointing someone else, he led the distraught White into this private room. Here, Moscone poured two drinks from these bottles of liquor into these glasses. Then Moscone lit this cigarette as he tried to calm White, asking about his wife and son. It was just like a roaring in my ears. And, and then it just it came to me, and then that was it. Then I, I just shot him. When Moscone's body was found, the cigarette was still burning. White then raced down the hall to Harvey Milk's office. I saw him come in and I said, Dan, can I talk to you? And he went by. I opened the door. I found Harvey on his stomach. I tried to get a pulse and put my finger through a bullet hole. He was clearly dead. As Feinstein was trying to calm the city, police went to White's Excelsior District home, where for days he had been holed up alone in a sleeping bag, poring over these newspaper clippings about his resignation, flyers opposing his reappointment, a photo of his dead father. Dan White wasn't able to handle it. He, my opinion, uh, he never belonged in City Hall. White's defense attorney says Dan White was a sick man and revealed his wife made him see a psychiatrist just a few weeks before he killed himself. As I recall, he had started medication for depression uh, uh, weeks before. That may have lifted him enough so that he had the energy to take steps to end his own life. Doug Schmidt believes the medication caused White to finally see clearly what he'd done and he couldn't live with it. On October 21st, 1985, he turned his car into a gas chamber in the garage of his home and sentenced himself to death.
When we come back on a second look, Rita's interview with the mother of Kevin Collins. And a bit later, the Pope came to San Francisco and Rita Williams was there. Follow Second Look on Facebook and Twitter. Tonight on A Second Look, we're looking at the career of KTV reporter Rita Williams, who plans to retire at the end of this month. As late as this month, Rita reported on a case that began nearly 30 years ago, the disappearance of Kevin Collins. It was the case that drew international attention and also played a significant role in the ongoing mission to find missing children. In 2004, Rita updated the search for Kevin as it stood at the time. It may seem like a strange place to go to remember your child on his birthday. Dearest Lord, we, we thank you. Um, I'm going to start crying. Thank you for the life of Kevin. Two weeks ago, Ann Collins' son, Kevin, turned 30, if he's still alive. Kevin, just 10 years old then, left basketball practice early at St. Agnes School in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury District 20 years ago today and disappeared without a trace. <laughs> 10 years ago, someone the Collinses still don't know paid for this marble bench in a Colma cemetery in Kevin's memory. Since then, it's been a magnet for people to leave remembrances for the little boy. But for his mother and sister, it's not enough. We still don't know. I mean, the bench is here, but he's not here. And I don't want just a bench. I want, a, you know, I want a body. When their son disappeared that day, Ann and David Collins were just ordinary people suddenly having to deal with an extraordinary event. I've always felt like, you know, there's all these tears down here, and if I ever start crying, I'll never stop crying. I'd never done a speech in my life, so I not only was going through the, the fear and the emotional strain, but trying to be something that I had no experience at. But they forged new ground, started a missing children's foundation in their son's name, committed to making it easier for families to recover their children. They advocated fingerprinting children, changing procedures so police immediately search for a child. And they provided support for families of so many other Bay Area children who disappeared, part of an exclusive club no one wants to join. Back then, there was no Amber Alert, no instant dissemination on the Internet, no video cameras to record an abduction. In retrospect, what they accomplished is amazing, getting Kevin's picture on milk cartons, on the cover of Newsweek magazine, even in the movie Terminator. Look closely at the missing poster in the police station. One of his brothers retraced Kevin's last steps in this police video. And on the fifth anniversary, police enhanced this photo to show what Kevin might look like at 15. To imagine what he might look like today, look at his brother Steve. But outside the view of cameras, the family struggled with finances, with worry, with loss. David and Ann divorced. Ann Collins says her children not only lost their brother that day, they also lost their parents. For many years, David spent all his time at the foundation. The first four or five years, it was certainly consuming and difficult emotionally, tough on the family. Ann helped too, hoping that keeping Kevin's picture in the news might bring him home alive. But back home, there were seven other Collins children plus a foster child. Then 19, Laura was oldest. We love you, Kevin. Where were you? They had to get to school and we had to grocery shop and cook and do little boy things mm -hmm. and there was nobody there for them. So Laura and younger sister Michelle, then 17, became surrogate parents. After a few years, they say the children got counseling and Ann resumed her role as mother and now as grandmother. But she still closely guards an envelope that contains all that's left of her missing son, sharing precious pictures she's never shown publicly before. He was always <laughs> smiling. He was just a happy, happy baby. Kevin Andrew Collins, her sixth born child out of eight. This picture is the very last picture taken of him. This was on his birthday, the year he disappeared. 
And this is the original photograph of that haunting picture of Kevin on all the posters. He was at the blackboard in a class for dyslexic children when a photographer called his name. The day before he disappeared, his father says, Kevin was so proud because he'd made his first A on a spelling test. He was really on a high note when it happened. That's what I remember the most. He got hurt at the best time. The family hopes that someday someone will provide the clue that will finally stop their grief and bring Kevin home. I really would like to know what happened. I want to know where he is and who did it, and I want them prosecuted. Everyone who loved Kevin is sure he's dead. I really think that in my heart, I feel like he was probably gone the first night. And you know, I just always pray that it was fast. And on what would have been his 30th birthday, a mother's prayer for her little boy stuck in time at 10 years old. He was a bright light. We, we praise you today on his birthday and, and uh, know that he's in your loving arms. And Kevin, I love you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. When we come back on a second look. It was kind of frustrating when they left after they talked to me and stuff. But... Rita talks about the stories that touched her personally. Follow Second Look on Facebook and Twitter. We continue our second look tonight on the career of KTVU's Rita Williams, who's retiring at the end of this month. Over the years, Rita's had the opportunity to cover a lot of well-known figures, going all the way back to an interview with Mother Teresa when Rita was working in San Antonio, Texas. In 1987, Rita played a key role in KTVU's coverage of Pope John Paul II when he visited San Francisco. It was an historic and emotional meeting at the Basilica of Mission Dolores. Pope John Paul II warmly greeted those along the center aisle of the church, some of the 900 invited guests. The Pope then approached the nine pews of AIDS patients. And certainly the most moving moment came when four-year-old Brendan O'Rourke, in his father's arms, reached out to hug the Holy Father. Little Brendan contracted AIDS from a blood transfusion at birth. The Pope then moved to other AIDS sufferers, most of them gay. It was the first time the leader of the Catholic Church has met directly with AIDS sufferers. From there, the Pope went alone to pray in the old mission, the oldest building in San Francisco. In prepared remarks, the Pope proclaimed the unconditional and everlasting love of God for all people, dwelling at length on sin and forgiveness. He did not mention homosexuality and only once referred to AIDS sufferers. He loves those of you who are sick, those who are suffering, from AIDS and from AIDS related complex. But it wasn't what the Pope said publicly the faithful Catholics here will most remember. It's the way the Holy Father personally moved each one of them. And I wasn't this excited when I got married and that was a wonderful day. <laughs> this has been the best day of my life and of Brendan's and of John. Knowing the Pope gave him a hug and touched, blessed us, and it's gonna help us through the, the ordeal we're going through. He put his hand on, on my head and then gave me a, a smile that said yes, that said, God loves you, I love you. In 1995, KTVU produced a special featuring our reporters. It was hosted by Bob McKenzie. And in it, Rita talked about how covering some stories had affected her personally. I think once you become a parent, you bring a different level to reporting, um, especially if it's a story about children. One was that affected me so deeply was a little boy, Michael Nguyen, who was murdered in Golden Gate Park. His uh, accused murderer still has not gone to trial. But I went to that little boy's funeral. The little boy had a Buddhist funeral, and I'd never been to one. And at the cemetery, they buried with him 
all of his personal things. And there was a McDonald's Happy Meal that was just like my son eats. There were his clothes that the mother folded and put in the grave next to her child. And there was a t-shirt and a pair of pants that my son had. And um, his toys, and there were the same toys. And you couldn't help but think that that could be your child. And I actually walked away in sobs from the funeral. And a reporter from another station came over and tried to console me um, because it affected me so deeply. Um, I think that the humanity, you have to have that in reporting and you have to be able to feel in some way what people are feeling that you're covering. Fortunately for reporters' mental health, there are happy stories too. Rita Williams and her photographer stayed on at Alpine Meadows when other TV crews gave up and went home, five days after an avalanche buried a young skier named Anna Conrad. Search crews were also giving up hope. I guess I'll never forget the owner of Alpine Meadows running out and with his German accent saying, Anna, Anna, she's alive. They found her, she's alive. Must have the helicopter flying in to bring her out along with the doctor. Uh, take care of her and uh, so there is hope there is hope I remember walking in that uh, emergency room and my knees literally were shaking and I asked her questions and felt like I was almost talking to someone who was superhuman we hear that you were real close to being found yesterday can you tell us something about that well I guess it was Friday they heard my uh, they were coming through and they yelled my name and I answered them but Either they didn't hear me or they couldn't get through because of the, of the, the problems with the avalanche. That's the only other time that was close. It was kind of frustrating when they left after they talked to me and stuff. But understandable, as long as they got through, I was happy. Before we go, I'd like to say a couple of words about Rita. It has been a real honor and a real pleasure to work with her over the years. Rita is without a doubt one of the best reporters in the country, just a phenomenal reporter and also a great person. But more importantly, I think she also got into this business for all the right reasons, because she really cares, because she wants to tell people's stories. And, and I really admire that, and I have admired her work over the years. And, and I can tell you just from a personal standpoint, we here at Channel 2 are really going to miss her. She's going to leave some big shoes to fill. That's it for this week's Second Look. I'm Frank Somerville. We'll see you again next week.